Joining us now is Professor Lawrence Tribe, who has taught constitutional law at Harvard Law School for five decades. Uh, Professor Tribe, I, I, I know you have a point you want to raise about funding uh, aid to Ukraine uh, using Russian funds, actually, that we have seized or frozen. But I want to begin with a point that uh, President Zelensky made today and that I first heard in the very first statement made by the Ukrainian ambassador to, to the Security Council when the war broke out. And it, it never crossed my mind before he said it, which is that Russia is not legally a member of the United Nations or the Security Council because the membership that they're using was given to the Soviet Union a country that no longer exists. And so uh, they are insisting that for Russia to have become a member, they sh Russia should have had to go through the normal membership uh, channels to become a member and not necessarily have that seat on the Security Council that was inherited, in effect, uh, from the dissolved Soviet Union. Well, it's an interesting point, and President Zelensky is nothing if not creative and incisive, but I think the odds that the membership of the current United Nations will agree with his position are not great, but it's a good point. It's a good point, especially because Russia exercising a veto over much of what could be done in a binding way by the United Nations is obviously essentially in the position of the criminal uh, who has the keys to the cell and says, I'm simply not going to give them back to the jailer. He I also, uh, I'm sorry, he also suggested a very American style idea of overriding those vetoes today, having the General Assembly, which is all the countries together, uh, if a two thirds majority votes to override the veto, they could override the veto, uh, just like the United States Congress uh, can do it. Uh, I, I want to move to your point uh, that you have raised about a potential funding force source for continued aid to Ukraine uh, using a law that hasn't been used this way before. How would that work? Well, the law, in fact, has been used. The International Emergency Economic Powers Act was used by President George H.W. Bush uh, to first freeze assets, sovereign assets, of uh, the invading nation of Iraq when it invaded Kuwait, and then, having frozen them, it seized them and transferred them to the victims of Saddam Hussein. The law is very clear, and it gives the power to the United States president without any further legislation to take the 35 billion dollars or so of central russian bank assets that are frozen in the united states and transfer them to the victims of russia's illegal and genocidal war of aggression it's a clear power and in fact if the united states exerts that leadership as i've explained and as the report that the law firm of Kepler, um, Kaplan, Hecker, and and uh, and Fink helped me develop this argument. Uh, as I've explained, when the United States first exercises that leadership, it's quite likely that other nations in the G7 will follow suit, and the total amount that can then be used to help reconstruct Ukraine uh, from Russia's own original money that's been frozen is well over $300 billion. And simply letting it sit there, uh, useless, is unconscionable. The report that I helped to write uh, establishes quite clearly that both as a matter of American law and as a matter of international law, it is perfectly legal to use Russia's money to help reconstruct Ukraine. And that's what I've been urging uh, the president to do. You know, as I go through the thought exercise on this, one of the things that that's not easy to imagine is at what point, given that it's frozen and you're not going to give it to Ukraine, at what point would you give it back to Russia? At what point would Russia have satisfied the conditions that would that would allow the president to reasonably unfreeze it? Essentially, when hell freezes over, mm -hmm. because it's quite clear that Russia is not going to compensate Ukraine to rebuild it. Russia is destroying Ukraine systematically. 
It's done well over half a trillion dollars of damage already, plus the incalculable human cost of the children kidnapped, of the, uh, of the people raped and murdered. Uh, so the condition that international law imposes and that all of the nations that have frozen Russia's assets have insisted on, namely that Russia first compensate Ukraine for what it's done, is not going to be met. So essentially, if we simply let the money sit there, we are appeasing Russia. We are encouraging further aggression. And none of the arguments, moral, practical, or legal, against using the money to help Ukraine hold any water. We have to put Russia's money where our mouth is. We've said we will help Ukraine. We have the means to do it. American taxpayers are, playing, are paying plenty uh, to help Ukraine wage the war. Now we should make Russia pay to help Ukraine reconstruct the damage that the war has done. It's fairly simple and very clear.